Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. We have a great show for you today. First, it's always about the money, just like I say it is, and it's no different in the Delphi case. Mayor Adams may have been allegedly tampering with witnesses. Daniel Penny gets some good news at his motions hearing. Karen Reed says, hey, wait for the trial about the money after the criminal case, and then we'll talk about the money. We have this day in legal history and a dumb criminal of the day. Let's talk about it. Good day, everyone. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk. Thanks for joining us. You know the drill. Subscribe if you haven't. Like if you do. Leave me a comment below, and make sure you hit that bell for notifications. And yes, you can check us out on any of your favorite podcasting apps. Well, it has been a day, ladies and gentlemen. I literally have spent uh, seven hours in the car driving, going to see clients in various uh, federal custody uh, matters, drove back and did a court appearance, and now am back here for Crime Talk. Uh, so it has been a day. We're going to do a quick show for you. I hope you enjoy it. So let's go ahead and uh, get to our sponsor. Yes, go to crimetalksearch.com. Sign up for that background subscription service today. And when you do, you're going to be happy that you did. When you sign up for that background subscription service, you are going to be able to get a report on anyone in the United States literally as you wait. And it's going to be emailed to you. And guess what? Just like we did it yesterday, right? I told you we did a, a background report on Sean Mickey Steins, the sheriff in Kentucky that shot Kevin Mullins. And the report came back of these are the two most uninteresting guys in the world, which makes their case even more interesting. But that background report is going to give you information on uh, address history, relatives, neighbors, associates, jobs, education, usernames as it relates to social media, other social media sites, um, photos, assets owned by individuals, criminal and traffic records, including whether somebody is a registered sex offender, bankruptcies, liens, and judgments, and find out if they are married or not, ladies and gentlemen. You're going to get that all emailed to you. Let's face it. You know you want to do it. You know there's somebody you'd like to check out. We use it almost every day. We check out dumb criminals of the day. We check out people that are involved in cases that interest us because there's always something in those reports. And sometimes nothing is something of value. The fact that nobody shows up with anything in their history is a good thing sometimes. All right, crimetalksearch.com, you'll be happy you did. All right, let's go ahead and open the record for October 4th of 2024. And first on the docket, what do they say, ladies and gentlemen? It's always about the money. And when they say it's not about the money, then you truly know it's about the money. So the uh, government officials are warning the people of Carroll County that the cost of the Delphi murder trial is likely going to be twice the initial estimate. So now it's going to be over $4 million. So it was originally reported back in uh, March of 2023 that county officials had asked for $2.1 million to pay for the most expensive trial ever in Carroll County. But a new public notice this week asks for another $2 million added to this year's county budget to pay for the trial. Now, jury selection begins Monday, October 14th. Now, unfortunately, this trial is not going to be telefied because of the judge, Frances C. Gull. She thinks we're all idiots and that nobody should be allowed to see what evidence the government has or doesn't have as it relates to Richard Allen. Now, Richard Allen, who is charged for the February 2017 murders of Abby Williams and Libby German near the Monon High Bridge there in Delphi, Indiana. Now, the uh, Carroll County Auditor posted a public notice this week that officials are asking the county council for another $2.4 million in appropriations, which is not already in this year's budget to pay for the trial. Now, the Carroll County Emergency Management Director, Mike Fincher, serves on a special committee planning for the trial. He said several factors are driving up the additional estimated cost. First, the trial is now scheduled for five weeks. Two more weeks have been added to the trial since the first cost estimate. And that's two more weeks, obviously, of transportation, hotels, rooms, and food for the jury and the judge's staff that are going to be brought in from Allen County. Now, um, Mr. Um, Allen, in this case, now has three public defenders representing him. That increases attorney's fees, and the defense has also added expert witnesses. 
Now the Carroll County taxpayers pay for the defense and the county will save some money as members of the Indiana Public Defenders Commission. However, the commission will reimburse Carroll County up to 40% of Allen's defense costs and that's a significant savings for this small county. Now the county has increased security in and around the courthouse for this case and the Carroll County Council will be asked to approve the additional 2.2 to 2.4 million dollars at the our October 17th meeting. It's expensive ladies and gentlemen. I've told you the story before. I had a boss when I was on active duty in the military and we kind of asking why are we spending all this money flying in all these people from all around the country and my boss looked at me and said there'll always be money for justice. Remember that ladies and gentlemen there's always money for justice. Next, Mayor Adams may get some more charges. That's right, the New York City Mayor Eric Adams could face additional charges in his corruption case and it's likely there's going to be some more defendants joining him at the defense table. Now, one of the prosecutors said there's evidence that Adams attempted to tamper with a witness in the investigation and claimed that the FBI agents contacted one witness. The individual was given a clear message from the defendant that they should not be truthful to the FBI. Prosecutors branded that as a significant instance of witness interference in this particular case. Don't tamper with witnesses once you're under investigation, ladies and gentlemen. Bad, bad things come from that. Now, the prosecutors also revealed that access to the mayor's cell phone had been um, unattainable after the government um, got his phone almost a year ago, back in November of 2023. And according to the indictment, uh, Adams had changed the password after learning of the investigation before telling police that, uh, oh, he had um, forgotten that he had a new one. Ooh. Anyway, prosecutors added that the additional unnamed defendants could be charged in the superseding indictment or in a separate case. And uh, for those who hadn't heard yet, yes, the sitting mayor of New York is currently charged with conspiracy to commit wire fraud federal program of bribery and receiving campaign contributions from foreign nationals. He's also accused of frauding the taxpayers of the great state of uh, New York in New York City of $10 million for allegedly fraudulent campaign fund reimbursement. Now he has pled not guilty and he is entitled to that presumption of innocence. And Mayor Adams has claimed that he has done nothing wrong. Next, Daniel Penny, remember him? Well, he got some good news at the motions hearing. So police officers responding to the scene at the New York City subway station where the homeless man who'd been placed in a chokehold by the former Marine veteran, Mr. Penny, was laying unconscious, opted to administer Narcan first rather than CPR. This came out at the motions hearing yesterday. So Daniel Penny, who's only 25, is standing trial this month accused of manslaughter and negligent homicide after he placed Jordan Neely, a homeless Michael Jackson impersonator with mental health issues, in a six minutes allegedly fatal chokehold back in May of 2023. But the officer's decision to give Mr. Neely a dose of Narcan before performing CPR minutes later could be crucial for the defense as lawyers for Mr. Penny rally against the state's effort to prevent them from calling witnesses to testify about Neely's history of drug abuse and mental illness. Prosecutors for the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, a guy by the name of Alvin Bragg, ever heard of him? Well, he has repeatedly been accused of being soft on crime, argued that Mr. Neely's history is not relevant to the case and that the defense is trying to smear Mr. Neely's good character so the jury will devalue his life. Now, Mr. Neely was um, behaving erratically as described by people on the subway, screaming and threatening at commuters on the train, which prompted Penny, then 24 years old, to intervene and throw the man onto the floor. Penny insists he was simply trying to subdue the man for the safety of others on the train and himself. And he has amassed somewhat of a, uh, quite a support group as he's raised more than $3 million in funds for his legal defense fund. The defense insists it is important. The defense insists it is important for the jury to have a full picture of what exactly Mr. Penny was dealing with at the moment, like a strung out drug addict. How could that not be relevant, ladies and gentlemen? Because we learned at the testimony of the officer under cross-examination, he indicates that first responders were also aware of the potential impact of drugs on the victim. 
Now, the defense lawyer for Mr. Penny says, you didn't do CPR for several minutes, right? Cop responded, we didn't. After being probed further, the officer revealed first responders did, however, use Narcan on Mr. Neely when they arrived. Now, for those who don't know, Narcan is a medication used to reverse opioid overdose. And the officer said, it seemed like Mr. Neely was still breathing and confirmed he still had a pulse when they arrived, which is obviously Mr. which is good for Mr. Neely. He is charged currently with second degree manslaughter, which only requires the prosecutors to prove that Mr. Penny acted recklessly, not intentionally, but he still has to prove that he was the one that caused the death. Now we have a subsequent intervening cause, i.e. the police officers and the paramedics. Go Mr. Penny, we're with you, buddy. We're with you. Next, Karen Reed. She wants to delay the civil trial. Makes sense, and normally that's what takes place. So obviously Karen Reed is uh, trying to delay a wrongful death lawsuit filed by the family of her Boston police officer boyfriend until her criminal trial in connection with that case is done. Now the lawsuit uh, filed last month blames the death of John O'Keefe on Miss Reed and also on what it describes as negligence by the bars that continued to serve drinks to her despite signs that she was drunk, often referred to as a dram shop case. It says that the uh, first bar served her seven alcoholic drinks in about 90 minutes the night of January 28, 2022 and that Reed carried the last drink into the second bar where she was served a shot and a mixed alcoholic drink within an hour. Now, Reed's attorneys um, filed a motion to delay a trial on that lawsuit until her criminal trial is done. And once again, for those who are not familiar with it, Ms. Reed is accused of ramming into Mr. O'Keefe, her boyfriend, with an SUV and leaving him dead in January of 2022 in a snowstorm. Her two-month trial ended in July when a judge declared a mistrial that new trial is scheduled to begin on January 27th. So that is not uncommon, ladies and gentlemen, when there is a criminal case and a civil case. Civil case usually gets put on hold because there's no speedy trial issues in the civil case. And obviously, Miss Reed has Fifth Amendment issues as it relates to self-incrimination. Eventually, she may have to answer questions in a civil case, but as of right now, she can maintain that silence pursuant to her rights under the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution. So it should get stayed. But it's always about the money, ladies and gentlemen. And um, I know Mr. O'Keefe's family wants justice through the criminal justice system, but they're gonna get more justice and more comfort through the civil process if there's any money. I don't know which how much money Miss Reed has, how much insurance she had on her home or car, anything about uh, that situation. Obviously, she's got a high-powered defense team, but my understanding is most of that is uh, either pro bono or through other people that are helping assist with those funds. So they may get nothing, but really they're going to go after the bars saying that something should have been done. Next on the docket, this day in legal history on October 4th, 1945, Justice Robert H. Jackson, who is an associate justice on the United States Supreme Court, was appointed as the chief U.S. prosecutor at the Nuremberg trials. These trials held Nazi war criminals accountable for World War II, and Jackson's role as the lead American prosecutor was a significant moment in international law and the establishment and accountability of crimes against humanity. Also on this date, on October 4th, 1978, President Jimmy Carter signed into law the Bankruptcy Reform Act, which is commonly known as the Bankruptcy Code. And this act dramatically changed the U.S. bankruptcy system, establishing the current Chapter 7, 11, and 13 bankruptcy provisions. And it aimed to provide more comprehensive relief to individuals and corporations struggling with their debt. And of course, that has since been modified, which makes it more harder and harder for people to discharge consumer debt in bankruptcy. And finally today, our dumb criminal of the day. That's right, an Oklahoma man is now behind bars for allegedly stealing an emergency truck after he couldn't get a ride to court for a hearing where he was already facing charges of motor vehicle theft. You can't make this stuff up, ladies and gentlemen. That's right, Cody Adams was at a gas station in Stillwater, Oklahoma, asking people for a ride to the Pawnee County uh, Courthouse for his court appearance where he's charged with possession of a stolen vehicle. When instead he hopped into an unoccupied LifeNet ambulance truck that had been left running. 
Now, the uh, carjacker took the uh, ambulance truck for a 30-minute joyride to the courthouse and then ditched the vehicle before he was apprehended while walking into the courthouse. Like I said, he was arrested and promptly admitted to borrowing the truck borrowing that's right when you borrow something you don't intend to permanently deprive somebody of that so therefore you're going to give it back so is it really theft after all he just merely liberated the the ambulance for a mere 30 minutes ladies and gentlemen is that really a crime after all yes yes it is anyway mr adams was taken into uh, his original court hearing and then he was booked on new uh larceny charges. He's currently being held at the uh, Payne County Jail, ladies and gentlemen. All right, that's all we have for you today. It was a quick show. Thanks for joining us. Have a wonderful weekend. We'll see you next week. And remember, the Constitution matters.